and share uh, your presentation? Oh, yes, of course. Uh... Everybody can see the, the screen? Yes, perfect. Uh, okay. Oh, I want to. I cannot change the tool. Yeah, there. Maybe here. I can remove this uh, these tools. Maybe here. What's the problem, Max? I don't understand. Oh no, uh, the the bar over the the screen. I don't know if you see. You can you can see the the yes. screen. Yes, this, 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 this bar. I don't know if you see it's in the middle. Yes, of the... This, this I can slide. Move. Okay. There. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation, the Arabuser, and thank you for the rest of the colleague to accept my participation here. Uh, I will just talk to about the, the anatomy of the middle fossa and mostly of the cavernous sinus. Um, that is the reason why I I do some uh, presentation uh, just uh, with the focus in the cavernous sinus and the different structures inside in order to uh, to know the application of the anatomy like uh, everybody know for the surgery. Yes. Uh, sorry again. I don't know what's happening with the with this tool. Uh, sorry. Uh, there. So. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the parallel cavernous sinus, uh, just to know the location, are located near of the center of, in the head, on each side of the cella, pituitary gland and the sphenoid sinus. Like everybody knows, they are formed by dural walls that surround uh, venous space or venous plexus, two dural walls, one inside and one outside, one uh, lateral or more medial. Uh, wall of the cavernous sinus can be described. I will try to explain uh, in in few minutes. So the cavernous sinus segment of the internal carotid artery pass through. Yeah, it's and also it's very important uh, the component, the neural component. That is the reason why we will describe the nervous uh, structures inside of the cavernous sinus. We we need to know, to know not just the vascular. The, the, the contents inside, uh, also the neural structures and uh, the connection between both sides of the cavernous sinus. That is the reason why I think the dissection in the laboratory and the knowledge of the anatomic uh, details for cavernous sinus in order to the application for surgery is crucial uh, at the moment to uh, analyze one case uh, in the real life, of course. In this view, uh, in the overview of the skull base, we can uh, describe the position of the cavernous sinus in both sides of the middle fossa. We see the relationship with the cella, we see the relationship with the middle fossa itself, uh, the clibus area, and the anterior clinal process, uh, of course, and the different points where the, the, the neural uh, structures. Uh, enter inside the cranial, the cranial, uh, the skull base 
like uh, foramen rotundum, foramen laserum, uh, foramen laserum for the uh, internal carotid artery rotundum, and foramen oval, like everybody knows. So even we can see in this slide the lateral aspect of the middle fossa and the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, we see uh, just the, the membrane, we see just the, the, the dura uh, uh, over the cavernous sinus. So we are uh, without vision inside, but if we do one resection of the dura in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, we can describe, we can discover the different uh, structures inside, in the middle size and the lateral size in relationship with the carotid artery inside of the cavernous sinus. So just to describe the extension of the cavernous sinus, we start with this description. The anterior uh, limit or the anterior uh, extension is the um, superior orbital fissure. The posterior limit is the dorsal cellular and petrox apex. I will show you in some pictures. The superior extension, uh, this uh, structure limit with the basal cistern, like everybody knows. And in the inferior portion, under the horizontal portion of the cavernous carotid portion, where the body of the sphenoid um, bone joined with the major wing of the sphenoidal bone. So in the medial aspect, the pituitary gland and the cella in the sphenoidal sinus, they are the limits in the medial aspect of the cavernous sinus. Also, the lateral aspect of the cavernous sinus, it faces the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. Is the temporal lobe uh, is the limit of the lateral aspect in the cavernous sinus? No, because uh, the, the temporal lobe uh, be part, of course not, but it's the limit. Uh, we talk about uh, the limit with the another structures outside the cavernous sinus, of course. So in the superior aspect of the, this slide, we can see the superior orbital fissure in the lower part, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus and the relationship between the carotid clinoid um, ligament and the medial aspect of the pituitary gland. We reflect the, uh, for, we reflect the carotid artery just in order to see the medial aspect of this structure and the limit with the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. In the upper part, in the right side, we can see the dorsal cellar, the posterior limit, even the petrox apex, like we talked before, and the cistern, like a crural system yeah, and the ambient system, like a limit in the top, in the roof of this uh, structure. So in the middle aspect of the temporal lobe, if we refract, if we go subtemporal and push the temporal lobe, we can see the middle aspect of the temporal lobe itself like a limit, like a extra uh, cavernous sinus structures. And uh, in, in the temporal lobe um, is like a landmark in the lateral aspect of the cavernous sinus itself. So the medial aspect of the cavernous sinus, we can see in this slice, we cut the specimen in order to dissect and describe the medial aspect. This vision uh, in the sagittal cut we can uh, see and describe the position of the carotid artery. We can see also V2, V1. We can see the sixth cranial nerve, the third cranial nerve, pituitary gland. Even we can see the basilar <clears throat> sinus. Even if we move the vision uh, in the back, we can, <clears throat> we can push the basilar artery in the posterior fossa in order to see the sixth cranial nerve coming from the apparent origin between the pons and medulla oblongata and make a hole at the, in, the, uh, in the clivus in order to reach the middle aspect of the cavernous sinus. This is the full view, another dissection, of course, where we remove the clivus and the basilar uh, plexus in order to describe and to, uh, to see the old, um, the old pathway of the sixth cranial nerve. Even we can describe from the top to down. For example, we can see the optic tract. Of course, in the lower part, we can see the carotid artery, the ophthalmic artery, the third cranial nerve. We can see very, very well the fourth cranial nerve. 
B1, B2, and B3, and the different triangles inside of the cavernous sinus. But in this way, we can see from the medial side. <clears throat> if we move forward, we can see the sixth cranial nerve, like I said before, coming from the apparent origins, even below the sixth cranial nerve. In the lower part of these slides, we can see the internal acoustic meatus and the, se the seventh and eighth cranial nerve. We cut the carotid <clears throat> in order to see uh, all the medial aspect of the cavernous sinus from uh, medial, medial wall. Even in these slides, we can understand the disposition of the uncus uh, in the middle aspect of the middle uh, face of the temporal lobe and the relationship between the lateral aspect of the cavernous sinus and the different structures with the temporal lobe itself. Well, we, we have walls and borders of the cavernous sinus. Uh, about this, it has four walls and two uh, edge. We will describe the medial wall, the lateral wall, the superior wall of roof of the cavernous sinus, like, like uh, we'll describe uh, in a few minutes, the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus, and the inferior edge, also the anterior edge. The cavernous sinus presents a triangular shape. Everybody knows the shape like a, like a ship, like an anterior portion of the ship. Uh, but this shape is when we see the cavernous sinus in the lateral view. So to describe the cavernous sinus, we can create some uh, like a landmarks here. Uh, we, we do this in order to uh, describe the cavernous sinus in the lateral vision. We can see the disposition most uh, of the time. We can move a little bit, but the cavernous sinus to the inferior border of the V2, posterior aspect, anterior aspect, superior limit and inferior limit of the cavernous sinus. Uh, about walls and borders, we continue with the descriptions. The inferior edge, this is formed by the junction between of the medial and lateral walls. It is located medial to the geyser ganglion in the anterior limit and in the back, the junction of the petrux apex and the body of the ephenoidal bone. The roof of the cavernous sinus, it is formed by the dura mater on the inferior edge of the anterior clinus process, like, uh, with, like we know, and the dural patch that join the anterior and posterior clinus process. Walls and border. We continue with the description to be more didactic. The posterior wall is very important because some pathologies, some tumors cross through the posterior wall to the posterior fossa, like my colleagues explained very, very nice. The connection with the basilar and petrux sinus, that is crucial to understand for many tumors. Um, for example, tumors who, uh, some tumors when they, they, they cross, like uh, different colleagues show before to me, uh, cross to the uh, medial fossa, to the posterior fossa. For example, for the, for the maker's cave, or uh, also we can, uh, we can destroy um, the, the clivus and uh, invite the posterior fossa through the middle fossa, of course. Even that tumors can be uh, destroyed the floor of the middle fossa in the lateral, lateral aspect of the cavernous sinus in order to reach the inferior uh, portion of the middle fossa. The inferior edge of the cavernous sinus is over the petroclivite fissure, the superior edge, posterior petroclinal dural folder from the posterior clinal process to the Petrux apex. This is very, very clear um, um, uh, folder to, to see in the dissection, for example. The lateral edge is medial to the ostium of the make escape, and the medial edge lateral to the cellar dorsal aspect. We can describe here this, uh, this structure. We see from the top to down, superior orbital fissure, B1 um, coming from back, the first branch the third cranial nerve in the roof of the cavernous sinus, like everybody knows, the fourth cranial nerve at the level of the tent, the free border of the, of the tent, even the relationship with the superior petrous sinus, we will describe after, but the petrous uh, ligament is in the back, just 
cover the sixth cranial nerve in the Dorelos channel, where the sixth cranial nerve coming from the uh, posterior fossa is entered um, in the cavernous sinus to, uh, to, to put lateral to the carotid artery like we will see uh, soon. Uh, if we move the vision to the lateral aspect of this slide, we can see the five cranial nerve and the Michael's case. The Michael's case, this is an important structure to understand when the tumor is coming from the middle fossa to the posterior fossa, like my colleagues show uh, before. Uh, of course, this connection between the cavernous sinus is not just with the lateral or medial aspect of, of, of this structure, even with the posterior aspect, like we, we talked uh, previously. I mean, uh, the, the limits, like a basilar plexus, and, uh, like we see here, the basilar plexus, the venous plexus, and in the lower part, the inferior petrosal sinus. All these sinus, venous sinus, are connected around the uh, the pituitary gland, and this connection make a complex, uh, complex system of connection between one side and the opposite side around of the uh, pituitary gland in the lower part at the level of the um, of the cella. Uh, about walls and borders, lateral walls, posterior, medial edge of the Merkel scape, anterior lateral edge of the superior orbital fissure, superior. Par, uh, petroclinal dural folder, we will describe uh, soon, in anterior from the anterior trinus process to the petrous apex. The inferior is the carotid sulcus under the horizontal portion of the cavernous carotid segment. So, medial wall is very important to describe. I will try to describe soon. Posterior wall, lateral edge of the cellular dorsal aspect, the anterior medial border of the superior orbital fissure. The superior is the intercranial ligament, and the inferior is the carotid sulcus under the horizontal portion of the cavernous carotid, whereas it's joined with the inferior border of the lateral wall. For me, the middle wall is a very, very uh, nice concept to describe. I will try to show in some pictures. Now I will try to show you one vision by endoscope dissection of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. The middle wall of the cavernous sinus is the membrane who uh, uh, cover the, the, the pituitary gland. I will try to describe, I will try to explain and show uh, to be more and more clear. But this video, uh, we do this dissection in order to describe uh, the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. We can see the pituitary gland inside of the cella. We reflect the carotid artery. Even we can see the optic uh, nerve the carotid, and even we can see there uh, the ophthalmic artery. You see that the four cranial are there, but it's important to, to see uh, the attach of the carotid by the carotid clinod ligament. We see is a very, very strong ligament. Uh, that is very important structure in order to uh, perform on the endoscope uh, surgery when we, we need to move the carotid from the anterior vision, we cut the uh, carotid clinal ligament in order to move, to push a little bit the carotid to reach some pathologies at this level when it's necessary, of course. But you see, here we see in, uh, in, the, in the full view, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. I will try to go a little bit faster in order to respect the times, but it's not necessary to see much more of this. Um, we continue with the lateral view of the cavernous sinus. This is the full view of the uh, carotid inside. The, inside the carotid, uh, inside the cavernous sinus, this portion of the carotid is crucial to understand the posterior part, the horizontal part, and the anterior part in order to reach uh, the superior aspect and, and make a hole at the level of the roof of the cavernous sinus. Even we remove here the proximal and distal ring just in order to see the full view of the carotid. Now we try to push the posterior aspect of the posterior um, uh, curve of the carotid. And even we can see the petrox uh, um, portion of the carotid artery. But if you push the posterior aspect of the carotid artery at the level of the, the cavernous sinus, we can see the medial aspect of the sphenoidal bone. And in this way, we can remove the carotid to reach the medial wall of the cavernous sinus itself. 
Now we can see the pituitary gland and you can see a little bit attachment, ligament. These ligaments are very, very important for the endoscope surgery in order to cut and mobilize the, uh, the, the gland. If we need to move the gland, we need to cut and we need to understand which type of ligament and the disposition and the variability of this ligament in order to don't damage and to make a space in order to reach the posterior aspect of the cella. And for example, for the posterior cranioidectomy by endoscope vision. This is a very interesting concept. So we continue with the description of the middle wall. Uh, here I push the pituitary gland this is the left side of the one specimen total dissection. And we can see the middle wall of the cavernous sinus is intact. This is very, very clear. We have the lateral wall and the medial wall. Why I talk about the middle wall of the cavernous sinus? Because it's very important because some tumors go, uh, or go through the middle wall of the cavernous sinus to reach the different portion of the cavernous sinus itself inside of the cavernous sinus, like a, a medial, uh, superior medial uh, compartment, inferior lateral compartment, or posterior compartment of the cavernous sinus. So here we see a little bit um, the disposition in the sagittal cut of the anterior portion of the pituitary gland and the disposition of the, uh, of the blood. I mean, the, the sinus, the anterior face of the pituitary gland, we see the, 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 the sinus crossing one side to the opposite side just for the anterior portion of the pituitary gland. And the, the folders uh, join at the level of the uh, neuropophysis. And after that, they, uh, they made a fusion and the cavernous sinus is now exist at the level of the posterior part of the gland. So to understand very, very well, I do this dissection in order to recognize the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. These narrows can show the different portions of the pituitary gland, the anterior and posterior portion. But I open the middle wall of the cavernous sinus because this, uh, this wall exists. And this wall make uh, like um, uh, surround, uh, is uh, surrounding the, the, the gland. So this is very nice concept because it's very useful at the level of the endoscope uh, surgery. Even this is the endoscope dissection to see in the anatomical uh, uh, position, the gland and the medial wall was totally open. Even we can see the carotid, of course, the different portion of the, of the carotid, the, uh, the, optic, the optic nerve. We see the third nerve, <clears throat> the Gruber ligament and the Dorero canal also, but the most important is the concept of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. The content of the cavernous sinus is very rich. So we have venous space, intracavernous carotid, third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve, and uh, even ophthalmic branch, of course, V1, they run through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and the sixth, like I said before. These cranial nerves run between the ophthalmic and the carotid uh, artery. Here, this is just didactic uh, reconstruction in 3D. We performed this in, in, in Stanford with Professor uh, Fernandez Miranda, of course, but it's very nice to understand and uh, to show for the new generations and the young neurosurgeons how important is the laboratory. Uh, you can see the disposition of the all full structure, one side and the opposite side of the cavernous sinus. This is very, very useful when we, when we try to understand the disposition of the different structures. Here is the lateral view. <clears throat> we have in the left side posterior, in the right side is anterior, and the content of the cavernous sinus is very rich, like I said before. We have from the top to down, third cranial nerve, four cranial nerve, we see the carotid, supraclinal carotid. We see the distal ring, the interclinal um, uh, space, um, proximal ring, the horizontal portion of the carotid. We continue with the posterior part of the carotid. We refract the sixth cranial nerve coming from the Dorelos canal. We see the, petro, uh, the um, uh, petrostenoidal ligament. In the lower part, we refract with the dissection, uh, the, the V1, and even we can see V2 and V3 in the different triangles uh, in, in the in the cavernous sinus. This full dissection in the anatomical position 
like uh, in a peeling, but we remove the dura mater of the of the brain just to see and uh, to understand the disposition of the different aspects uh, and the structures inside the cavern sinus. We can describe the from below to up. For example, we remove uh, here the anterior cranial process. We see the optic nerve, the carotid, supraclinal carotid, the distal ring, interclinal uh, space. We see the uh, proximal ring. B, uh, we can see uh, uh, the third cranial nerve, the fourth cranial nerve coming from the back. B1, <clears throat> we see the petrosal portion of the carotid. We see the anterior medial uh, triangle. We see B2. We, we can see the, uh, the lateral triangle, uh, anterior lateral triangle. We see also B3 and the posterior in the posterior up, um, zone of the B3, we, we can remove the, um, the petrox apex, like a Kawasi approach, in order to reach the posterior fossa after <laughs> the open the druga madre, and we can see the uh, seven and the cranial nerve. Here is the endoscopic view. We refract B1 to understand the disposition of the six cranial nerve lateral to the uh, to the to the side of the carotid artery running from the medial aspect of the V1 and the relationship between third cranial nerve, fourth cranial nerve, V1, and sixth cranial nerve. Even we can see the lateral aspect of the pons, the five cranial nerve, the origin of the fourth cranial nerve, the, the, the motor and sensorial roof, and the seven and eight uh, cranial nerve. Here, <clears throat> to understand the disposition in the Dorelos canal of the uh, six cranial nerve, we put one narrow, uh, like uh, white and black. The black is, is showing the six cranial nerve and the relationship with the ligament behind this uh, cranial nerve crossing the, the relos canal to join in the cavernous sinus lateral here in this in this case to the to the carotid and uh, the the position is uh, medial to the V1. Even we can see in other structures, but everybody knows this structure here. So we do some uh, different dissection here in order to see what is the apex, the petrous apex, and which structure we can find if we remove uh, or skeletize P1, B2, and B3 to understand the disposition of the full uh, view of the petrous uh, portion of the carotid artery. Uh, of course, I will not uh, explain all the structures here, but the most important is the disposition of the carotid artery in this dissection and how important it is when we do some trigeminal schonomas at the level of the middle fossa. This is a, a fast step-by-step -step cavernous sinus dissection in anatomical position. Just to finish um, some part, I want to show you this uh, dissection. We can see the lateral full view of the cavernous sinus, the gas cell uh, ganglion. We see, uh, of course, the tent, the carotid, supraclinal carotid, ophthalmic R, um, um, optic tract, optic cranial nerve. We see the roof of the cavernous sinus, where the third cranial nerve make a hole to enter and go through the uh, supraorbital fissure, V1, V2, V3, and of course, the fourth cranial nerve. So here we can define and, and describe the position of the cavernous sinus. Now we refract B1 to understand the disposition medially, the sixth cranial nerve, like I said before. Now we refract the five cranial nerve at the level of the Meckel scape to understand the position and the limit of the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. There is the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. Even we see blood there. Now we refract the posterior aspect of the V1 in order to see the relos channel and the sixth cranial nerve how we can see the shape of the sixth cranial nerve in the lateral aspect of the uh, of the carotid artery. We continue with the step by step dissection. We refract the third cranial nerve uh, in order to see the, um, the the horizontal portion of the carotid before to go and uh, and cross through the, the the roof of the cavernous sinus to be uh, or to reach the supraclinal aspect. Now we push V1 uh, a little. The petrolingual ligament. Where is the petrolingual ligament? Of course, if we push a little bit more, we can describe and find the petrolingual ligament 
where is the attach a little bit of the petrosal portion of the carotid. Even in the upper part, we see the grubber ligaments and the dorelos channel, of course. Petrosphenoidal ligament there. Aka, uh, here we see the petro -liga petrolingual ligament in the lower part of the carotid. We refract the five cranial nerve. This is the step-by-step -step dissection. Now we see all full dissection of the cavernous sinus and the disposition of the, um, of the carotid. Sometimes the roof of the carotid in the petrox portion is a, is a thin a layer of the bone. That is very important because we need to be very, very careful uh, in the, in, at the moment to do one Kawasi approach at this level. So, now we push the medial, uh, the medial wall of the carotid to describe the medial aspect of this area. We crush with the sphenoidal bone there. Now we see from, from, from the roof, we can see the different branches of the, uh, of the, um, of the carotid, we, de we will describe after. I continue with the dissection, full view from the top. Now we do one escalation of the anterior cranial process, we remove the anterior cranial process to see the full view in the lateral aspect of the carotid. We still uh, with the, a little bit layer of the bone, but if we remove that layer, we can see the superior aspect of the uh, carotid, supraclinal aspect of the carotid artery. The, um, we can see the proximal ring, the distal ring, with, without uh, anterior cranial process. Just to, to finish, we see the full view. We refract the optic nerve to see the disposition of the optic uh, uh, ophthalmic artery and the medial aspect with the different uh, artery branches coming from the uh, dorsal aspect of the, of the carotid to reach uh, the, the pituitary gland. Now, Full view, we see the phenoidal, um, the phenoidal, um, we remove the optic, uh, sorry, we remove the anterior cranial process uh, and we can expose the phenoidal uh, membrane, I mean the phenoidal uh, uh, sinus in the anterior uh, portion of the, um, of the carotid artery. Here, the middle wall of the cavernous sinus and here the, the carotid clinal ligament, where the, uh, the, the carotid artery is attached to the medial wall of the cavernous sinus and the cavum carotid, like everybody knows in this aspect. Now we see the disposition of the carotid in the carotid channel in the lateral wall of the uh, phenoidal uh, bone. The anterior clinal process, we see this bone process goes background uh, from the minor wing of the sphenoidal over the anterior part of the sinus, the structures insert in the anterior kinos process. Which structure? They are anterior medial attach of the tentorium, anterior petroclinal ligament, and the interclinal ligament, and falciformal ligament. Here we can describe this different type of triangle. We see here the the anterior clinoid, the posterior clinoid, and the interclinoid uh, ligament. We see the triangle where is the roof of the cavernous sinus, where the third cranial nerve make a hole in order to reach the interior part of the cavernous sinus. Anterior clinoid process, the base of this uh, process have three points of attach. Lateral is follow the minor wing of the phenoid, talbon, the medial aspect from the body of the phenoid, to the anterior kind of process, the anterior attach is the branch of the minor wing, the roof of the ophthalmic conduct, and the posterior branch is the optic tract. Here, very, very fast view, we see the different aspect of the anterior kind of process and the different point of the attach. We see um, every, uh, every one. The medial cranial process, we can see here the medial cranial process, sometimes we can find and can, can do one ring around of the, of the artery. Sometimes it's, it's very complicated to remove. The neural, the, the neural relationships, these structures run around, sorry, uh, through the cavernous sinus. We have third cranial nerve four and B1 in the ophthalmic branch. They run uh, through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and six cranial nerve, it's run between the ophthalmic branch and the 
carotid artery. Here, full view where we can see the third cranial nerve, fourth cranial nerve in order to up to down, the, the trigeminal nerve, here the five cranial nerve, B1, was cut to see the, the carotid artery, B2 and B3. So if we see very, very careful, now we, in this dissection, we can see every one of the structure from top to down, third cranial nerve, fourth cranial nerve, carotid artery in the middle aspect, six cranial nerve, B1, B2, B3, and the different triangle like I will describe. The third cranial nerve entered enter in the roof of the cavernous sinus, I, I, I said before, here in this description, we can see in, the, in this uh, picture the, um, the position of the third cranial nerve in the roof of the cavernous sinus, and even lateral to, to them, the fourth cranial nerve, and in the posterior aspect, the five cranial nerve uh, enter to the um, Michael scape. The neural relationship, the ophthalmic branch from the inferior part of the lateral wall to reach the superior ophthalmic fissure, and the sixth cranial nerve enter in the inferior part of the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus through the Dorelos canal, like everybody knows. Here again, the lateral aspect, we remove part of the, uh, we, um, we push, uh, sorry, the B1 in order to see the petrolingual ligament and to describe the disposition of the uh, six cranial nerve in the lateral aspect of the carotid artery. The triangles to finish, we have, uh, we have 10 triangles, their interest is more academic than in surgical interest. We can divide in, um, in, for example, triangles of the cavernous sinus, we have four triangles of the lateral middle fossa, four and triangles of the paracleval area, we have two. In order to describe the oculomotor triangle, this is performed by intercranial ligament, petrocranial anterior and posterior ligament. The infratrochlear uh, triangle is between the trochlear cranial nerve, the four cranial nerve, and the ophthalmic B1. And here we can find most of the time the origin of the meningo hypophysal arch, supratrochlear triangle or Parkinson triangle between the third and the four cranial nerve. And clinoid triangle between the optic and the oculomotor, like we see three cranial nerve. Anterior triangle between the B1 and B2, Glasgow between B2 and the major petrous nerve, and posterior medial triangle between the major petrous nerve and the lateral border of the trigeminal nerve. Here, this is the roof of the cavernous sinus, and this is the different triangle from the top to down, oculomotor triangle. Clinoid triangle, we see supratrochlear, infratrochlear, anteromedial, anterolateral, posterolateral, and posteromedial or kawase approach. The uh, relationship with the arteries, the artery, the most important, the carotid artery entering the skull base from the foramen lacerum and passing behind the petrolingual uh, ligament, around two centimeters in the horizontal position to the carotid sulcus and uh, go to the anterior portion to reach the anterior clinoid, we are in this process behind the optic tract. And at the end, it penet penetrates the roof of the cavernous sinus. Here, this is the full view of the carotid artery in the cavernous sinus in the petrox apex. We remove the, the, the petrox apex to, the, to, to see or to, to describe the disposition of the petrosal portion of the carotid coming below and in the, in the lower part um, uh, of the trigeminal nerve. Petrolingual ligament is hidden behind the motor roof of the trigeminal nerve. And this disposition continues to reach the interior of the cavernous sinus and to make a hole in the roof to be a supraclinal portion of the uh, carotid artery. Uh, <clears throat> some relationships and branches of the intracavernous carotid they are the meningo, meningo hypophysal branch is the first and the bigger branch. She is divided, or we can divide in three branches: uh, the Bernasconi Casinari, one hundred percent of the case, run free in, in the free border of the tentorium, the inferior hypophysal artery, and meningeal dorsal artery. Also, the inferior artery of the cavernous sinus and the McConnell artery, very rare of to find in one dissection for sure. Here, the meningual hypophysal artery, we see in the dorsal part of the uh, horizontal portion of the carotid, dorsal meningeal artery in the lower part. 
and the tutorial artery in the uh, in the little bit um, in the little uh, picture. The bend of relationship to finish the presentation. Max, the we exceed our time. Please, uh, oh, okay. can summarize. Okay. Yeah, it's just the venous relationship is important to to know because the carbon sinus is the venous uh, complex system, and it's connected with the dura mater, the dura veins, the dura veins, transversal sinus, superior petrosinus, sinus, and the uh, of course uh, the basilar sinus. Here we see the basilar sinus, superior petrosinus, sinus, and the disposition with the anterior portion of the pituitary gland. So, <clears throat> of course. Here is the anterior view of the of the gland. We can see in the left side the disposition of the um, of the sinus connecting both sides of the pituitary aspect. Here in the right side again in the frontal view and the disposition of the anterior sinus of the pituitary gland. I don't want to show this video because we don't have time, but uh, just to say thank you and again. In my opinion, the uh, the time expend in the lab with people and mentors like we you see in these pictures, uh, I think is crucial to to learn. is crucial to to do the best performance to do neurosurgery. So, in my opinion, expend time in the lab, expend time with your mentors is very very important. So, thank you, thank you very much. We thanks for all your presentation. A fantastic section, and we are lucky to have you and uh, listening to the uh, region from you. Uh, any comments and any question? I think this is a very detailed anatomy. Officer Anike, do you want to say something? I, I cannot uh, see you. You, you can unmute yourself, Eric. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maximiliano. Excellent presentation. Really uh, wonderful work and very, very important for the for the surgery. And uh, also for the other, uh, other uh, presentations was uh, really a webinar fantastic. And I am very happy and thank you. All, uh, to all of you. Abujar, uh, Keki is with us. Dr. Keki Tural, maybe he can comment on yes. some points. Keki, are Dr. you with Keke. us? I don't think so. Keki, I, I saw him, but I don't know. He's not there. <laughs> okay. May if, uh, Professor Sabino or want to say something? Yes, beautiful webinar and uh, congratulations once again to all of you and congratulations especially to Professor Abu Zer and all the professor for the, this organization. But we need more of these meetings. So please, this is this should be just the first one on a long series. We hope with all of you and uh, thank you once again for all of you and congratulations for the excellent quality and didactic uh, role of this beautiful meeting. Thank you, Samino. Thank you. I think we must tell that um, uh, Dr. Vinko Dolank could not join us. Uh, and then we are uh, lacking his talk. Uh, but uh, I wish we can we can have him in one of our next meetings in the future. Okay. I want to thank all attendees to uh, join our meeting. I think it's okay. time to finish and close the meeting, Professor Zeleni. Thank, Thank you, you Abuja. for this opportunity. Thank all the speakers uh, for being with us and uh, teaching uh, our group. Uh, and also, I, I thank all the participants today. I wish to see you again in the future webinars. Thank you, 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 Thank you,